You are watching Leicester Till I Die TV. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, goodbye, hello, depending whereabouts you are in the world. Welcome along, uh, sloppy seconds, <laughs> I wish. Uh, this is LTID TV from Leicester Till I Die, the second show of the evening. Uh, thank you for joining us, whether you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. Do get your comments and your questions in, or listening via your favourite podcast platform. We appreciate you lending us your ears. Uh, do join in, like I say, in the chat, or if you're watching on Catch Up, Stick the comments in the YouTube description below and uh, all welcome. They all get read. They all get read. Um, those that uh, that were watching earlier uh, or were watching a talk TV yesterday who may have noticed I went a little bit all Hulk on, uh, on TV. Um, don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. Uh, but look, I've, I've, I've counted to I've counted to 100. I've calmed down. Uh, so much for this being a quiet week. No, no football. It's international week. It's only friendly. So we can completely ignore it. I was just going to have a week off and put my feet up. And then look what happened. <laughs> yes. Thank you, EPL. Thank you, um, EFL. Um, hello here, uh, Michael. You're in. Uh, and uh, Brad's in. Good evening, Brad. How are you? And Ronald is back with us as well. Uh, I'm going to welcome my guest. I'm really so, so... Um, oh. There we have lost me a bit of paper, but I'm so happy to have this gentleman in. Uh, I did lose me uh, lose me temper a little bit yesterday. We call it passion. Let's bring him in. I think he's forgiven me and say hello to Gavin. Hello, Gavin. How you doing? Yes. Come on. <laughs> I, uh, I make 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 peace, not war. That's what I say. <laughs> well, make love, not war. They so probably don't want to. How are you doing? Thank you so much for coming on. No, it's very good to be here, Chris, and well done for what you and all Leicester City fans are doing at the minute. It's important your voices are heard. It is, um, and and of course you're not actually with the EFL at the moment, but you are. Now let me get this. Do you want to give your 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 position out when you were there? Yeah, well, look, I had a few different positions there, but it was mostly on the communications and external affairs side, and I was director of uh, marketing communications when I left the EFL um, about 13 years ago now, so many moons ago. So yeah. I am not a spokesperson for the EFL or the Premier League or anything like that anymore. No, no, we, we, we must make that uh, make that, that, that clear that you're not and you're, you're not with them, say, at, at the moment. And of course, more than anything, you are a football fan and you're on uh, one of the boards for the fans with Fulham, your club. Yeah. Yeah, and, and good years on the pitch at Fulham, but less so off the pitch, actually, Chris. We're having some difficulties with the club in terms of fan engagement, uh, particularly around the creation of the new fan advisory boards and things like that, which is very disappointing because Fulham's usually a very good club, good owners, I think. Um, but uh, there's just some friction there and it's not great. So it's leaving a bit of a sour taste in fans' mouths at the minute. And, you know, I follow Fulham home and away. Um, uh, and uh, I love the club, uh, but it's just a bit unfortunate, really, because we're seeing so much success on the field um, with an amazing manager and Marco Silva. We're just surprised yeah. he's still with us. He's so good. Um, and it'd be great if the sort of fans, legacy fans, really, if we're being honest, if we go back to the parlance of the Super League, these are fans who have been around for years through thick and thin. And they're not really being treated in the right way, in my view. They're not just their voices aren't being heard. And they were heard a few years ago. They just seem to have forgotten about us a bit. Do you think fans 
generally, and I'm not I'm just saying any club here. I mean, you know, as much as I love my club, and I think we're very lucky with the owners we've got, despite everything that's going on at the moment, I think they are the owners that every other club would love to have. Um, and we've been through tragedy and they've stuck with us. But do you think what I mean, I said this yesterday on the show, didn't I? You know, when we had COVID, we all heard about, oh, you know, we miss yeah. the fans. We want the fans back in. And there was at the FA Cup, which was one of the first games I think, where, where fans were back. And, you know, even the commentator said, oh, it's great to hear fans, even though they're booing. It's great to hear them. But now it's back. It is almost like we don't matter. We're just a commodity. Well, I think there's certainly an increased feeling of that. And by the way, I'll take a very, very, very small part of my story was that when I was at the EFL, I was on the panel that uh, approved your owner uh, coming oh, in, right. your, your late owner, by the way. Yes. Uh, so great, regretfully and very sadly. Um, yeah. And I always look back and look at that and say, what a job he did there, an amazing legacy. Uh, and, you know, um, but at Fulham as well, we've got brilliant owners who've put a load of money into the club in very sensible ways and building great infrastructure in terms of our new Riverside stand. But I think this whole point you're making is, I think there's something in it. You know, I I go around with my son watching Fulham and away games, etc. And even going to away games now with flags is not as easy as it used to be a lot of grinds have banned them and are sort of saying you can't take a non-offensive flag into the grind without in at villa you have to get permission at least a week in advance yeah, wow. burnley and burnley you're not allowed to flag due to safety concerns and none of the, uh, it's i mean it's and, and it's a sort of fan culture element for getting and i think maybe we just over it a bit towards the internalization internal in sorry internalization of the game where we're looking mm for how it looks overseas rather than what people are feeling here. And of course, I'm not talking about going back to horrible, nasty, you know, booze driven uh, no, fan no. culture, but there is somewhere in between. And maybe we've just gone slightly too far, I think, across all the um, the league structures. There, there is. I think that's just the, the country at the moment. You can't say boo to a goose without upsetting somebody. You know that that that's the problem. You know, and yeah, I remember um, on watching GMB one morning, and they were having a go because we booed somebody's national anthem in the Wembley game, and uh, that's been going on for years. It's what fans do, <laughs> but we don't. We've got that thing now. We don't say anything just in case we upset somebody. But you are, as I say, on on the fan board at, at Fulham, and I'm not disrespecting Fulham because I don't count us as a big club now but we're outside of that so-called big six which so suddenly appeared when sky uh came along i, I don't uh, think that's disrespectful in any way chris to say that fulham yeah. aren't a big six club i think we're lucky to be a big 20 club you know in our minds so don't worry about that but th that's the thing though isn't it like you've got this big six and i mean i just want to read you this that uh, i found um the other day uh this was in the independent this was written back in um 2020 by a gentleman called uh, miguel delaney and he said and this is what he's quoted this we don't want too many leicester cities uh, these were the words spoken by a senior figure from the premier league's big six clubs in the kind of high-end london hotel you can easily imagine football history suggests fans like big teams winning he said uh, in the group of business people and media figures present a certain amount of unpredictability is good but more democratic league would be bad for business. Yeah, but, but Chris, what's really one, he's a great journalist, by the way, and a wonderful writer. Uh, I've read yeah. a lot of his great stuff, particularly on where the, the leagues are, etc. But the one key part there is that's someone in the big six saying that. That's not someone in the Premier League. Because I know for no. a fact that the Premier League do point towards what happened with Leicester City constantly, because actually it's a great rebuttal point about mm. the, the big six uh dominating. So I would say to you, just be careful about that sort of thing. And this is what I weirdly spend my life doing when I'm doing broadcasting on sports business and sports politics. I'm yeah. often the boring guy who's pointing out the reality of situations which don't fit. And, and I'm actually with you there. But that is one of the big six. And of course, they'd say that because they want to they want to 
control the game. And actually, in a weird way, they've been beaten off, whether it was Project Big Picture or whether it was Super Leagues in recent years. So they've not had their way. But Leicester City has been one of the proof points. And I know if you look at the Premier League, uh, they are so proud of the fact that a team like Leicester City won that league. And I, I myself, you know, as a Fulham fan and a football fan, I love it. And I know it's the classic underdog story, but you won by nine points, didn't you? I mean, it wasn't ten was it points. Nine points? Yeah. Nine, ten points. Well, I mean, that's just extraordinary, really. Yeah. And um, you know, uh, but and this is why I think what's happening now is so shocking to fans because we've always looked at Leicester City as the example of how to do it, how to buy players in cheap, sell them on at a higher price, how mm. to control the wages sensibly, how to invest as your owner is always done in terms of the infrastructure around the club and make it a world-class club off the field as well as on the field mm. and yeah you, it just goes to show how tight it is when you're a and i hope you don't mind me saying it's a smaller club than the big six when you get a couple of seasons wrong and you start throwing money at it in a sort of desperate way it catches up and that's that's the really sad thing i think that's happened here and um i was not surprised by Forrest. I was not surprised from Everton. I sort of knew Everton were in trouble a few years ago. And it's sort of people in the football world talk and, you know, you speak to journalists and everyone kind of knows. I was very surprised that Leicester City have fallen in this way because I had it been off my radar. It has, but uh, I mean, it's almost like we, we, we've been punished twice um, because before I just go on to Leicester, I just want to say, hey, I accept what you're saying about that it's the big six not necessarily the Premier League. Unfortunately, for me, I think with the Premier League, because they're so secretive, and this is something I said last night, why is all of this being done behind closed doors? I think, you know, I think we should get into that, though, Chris, because I don't agree with you at all, because it's not secretive in the sense that they... I mean, I've read both the Commission's findings for the Everton case and the appeal findings for the Everton case in detail, they publish all that and they will do so for Leicester as well. So there's nothing secret about that. What means is there is proper discussions behind the scenes. And by the way, every club signed up for this, for this way, including Leicester. And I know your I know your point about the expedition, uh, the, the expediting, sorry, off the um off the process mm. not coming after. But in terms of the commission being independent. And being in acting in this way, Leicester City and all the other clubs, at least fourteen of them, agreed uh, that. And yes. yeah, yeah, but 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 it, but but just give me give me right here. I see no reason why Leicester City wouldn't have wanted that at the time. And probably, if we're being honest, if this was anyone else, they would want it as well. Because even though it's done in private, because just think about this, it's not the Premier League looking at it. It's three independent people who are brought in, mm -hmm. and if you suddenly start doing that in public. You're asking independent experts to start appearing on television or doing interviews and all of that, playing it out openly. It's a completely different world. I know from my time at the EFL, whenever we went through point deductions for Leeds United and Luton Town, etc., some of our senior team received death threats, Chris. Okay, so death threats. Wow. Okay, so just, just ask yourself this question. Do you want to put independent experts who are experts on not Leicester City, but in terms of football finance, and the accountancy to have to play this out in open. And I just say, no, do it in private, do it properly. Do not allow politicians to try and influence this. I've seen letters from politicians, by the way, on Everton, on Forest, and now on Leicester. Yeah, all John Ashton, yeah. In. And, and it, yeah. come on. So this is the point. Everyone thinks they're being hard done by. Everyone signed up for it. Low, to be fair to Forest, they didn't because they weren't in the league at the time. But Everyone signed up for it, and Forrest signed up for it when they joined the Premier League because, in effect, you join and join the rules. Yes, you, you accept the rules. So this is my point. I just, I, I'm living in a world where I'm sort of feel like I'm looking through the looking glass at times and seeing politician upon politician, you know, coming out and saying, "Oh, it's a disgrace that everyone have been charged, being picked on, or we're picked, double counting with Forrest because of where they've been." And now the same thing with Leicester City. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting fans or bad people or anything like that. But one thing I just say is be slightly cynical and ask yourself questions. Why is the club trying to position it like this? 
What are they trying to achieve? And I think with Leicester, I don't know. I'm not the legal expert. I'm not no. the um, accountancy expert. But it just looks obvious to me that they're trying to throw everything at it because it's a sizable amount. Um, and by the way, on PSR, so profitability and, profitability and sustainability rules, it's pretty much self-evident as soon as you publish it. OK. Um, yeah. And by the way, Leicester might be banging on about openness, but they've not published either their numbers yet. And I think we'll all see when they do, sadly and regrettably, that it's very obvious. But then then down the line, once that is done, OK, once it is done and in place, they're trying to muddy the water as much as possible to make this go as far as possible away to hurt their chances of promotion, which it won't do. I think that'll be fine. But mm -hmm. also to make sure that when it comes back, they're already up and they, at least they've got a chance. And I see this. I don't see this as a real chance to really change the game. I see this as the very clever lawyer, Nick DeMarco, trying yeah. to throw as much mud at this to try and help. Leicester City get away with as much as possible uh, before and to to put off the the damages um, etc. And look, I'd also just say be cynical as well about why people do this because owners get upset because they put a lot of money in and they want to fight everything. And when you when you have a load of billionaires, which these men mostly men tend to be, and obviously in Stoke City it's it's slightly different. Um, but you know you 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 they get angry and they throw money at lawyers to try and resolve their problems and and i actually don't see any of that as helpful because it's just slowing everything down and people criticize the timings but actually it's because clubs keep trying to fight it and if you look at the everton case everton it was over a year ago now that or about a year ago this first came to um to a charge against everton and then of course they didn't cooperate they kept saying nothing had happened they weren't hadn't breached the limits but chris they would have breached the limits clearly in the accountant accounts that they give to the Premier League. That's the irony with this. It would have been clear within it. They would have mm. said there's um, circumstances, mitigating circumstances, etc. would have been the argument. Then they finally admit to it in September, October that, yes, they have breached it. So it took several months to get them to admit it. Then there was a charge. Then there was an appeal. And then we had recently the appeal finding. And, OK, they've won a couple of points, deduction, etc. But... It's going through and they're going to probably see a repeat of that, which is why we get in this mess over things not being done for the end of the season. And look, none of that is meant to say you guys are not doing what you should be doing as pride fans. But I'm mm. just saying be slightly cynical and don't be caught up in this because I've seen some absolute nonsense spoken, particularly around the Everton and the Forest cases so far. And it just makes me think, come on, guys, get real about this. But is it? Look, you know, you 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 know, you were um, director of marketing. Um, is is it not worrying that despite all of this that you're doing, the fans still seem to think that it is this secret organisation? I jokingly said, you know, is is it you know, is it a, is it a branch of the Masons? You know, a secret. But, but, it, but it is a it is a club. No, but it isn't as you if you you know what what you're saying. It isn't. But that's how it's still being perceived by the majority of working class fans. But 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 that's because your club is in effect being cynical in the way it's um, said it's fighting this. Let's be blunt about that, you know. And, and because there's very good reason why these independent commissions and the key is independent. So they're you're not. It's not even the leagues in either case that will look into this. It's independent groups of top notch experts um, who look into this. Now, look, how these leagues function, so the Premier League, the 20 shareholders meet on a regular basis, they have conversations, they don't publish the minutes of that because it's a club. You have to be a member of it and you have to be a shareholder in it, but you get there by being promoted uh, uh, and you fall out when you're relegated and then you become a member of the EFL. And again, they have shareholder meetings, but the EFL also has a board, a representative board, uh, which has some independence on it as well, uh, but it has representatives from the championship from League One and League Two. So they're slightly different. The Premier League also has an independent uh, uh, group board, board uh, grouping as well um, and a chair, which is different. So they've put those in place, but they don't have to publish every minute, et cetera. But I, I would just say to you, if you look at them compared to most sports out there um, and most um, league structures around the world, we've got two of the best on the planet and, um, you know, the championship is in the top 10. Um, I think it might be 
much higher than that in terms of TV numbers and certainly in terms of um, income. The Premier League's at the top because it's by far the best. And whether, you know, we can all have our, our, our views on it, but it's helping the rest of the game, no matter what you think. That is the reality. So I, I think just be careful in terms of falling into that because I don't think it's about working class people thinking this or that. I think people get it. It's what it is. It's a club. And if you, you're in it, you are in it. But they do publish a hell of a lot. And if you go to the governance pages of the Premier League and the EFL, you'll see everything. The problem is, Chris, no one goes there. And people fall for the, they fall for the rubbish that's mostly come from politicians on the Everton case and on the um, Forest case. And, you know, I know there's been some letters already from Leicester, but mm. hopefully people will have seen through that. And if you ask other fans, they think, well, it's the rules. Yeah, I, I, as I say, I do understand it. I, I just think that there's something failed as I wouldn't even know where to start looking for it. Do you know what I mean? It's, 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 oh, well, it's Google, 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 club rules, mm. EFL, club rules, Premier League. I mean, generally, because sorry to be silly about this, everything is there. I'm not a member of these organisations and you can get them. And, and, you know, I make it my job to make sure I'm staying up, as up to date as possible, just as someone who does a bit of commentary on football yeah. business and football finance. But I'd just be, be really clear again on this. You know, the Premier League and the EFL have not taken venture capitalist or private equity money in a way that other leagues have. It, they are far, far better off as a result. And our clubs, wherever they are in the pyramid, are better off as a result. So we talk them down, but actually... You know, and, I ha and I'm critical, as you will know, if you watch me on SAG's show every week, I'm as critical as they come about both on certain issues. And as I've been with you, we were chatting about, you know, fan engagement at the start and my concerns around that. But fundamentally, I don't think there's a great conspiracy there. In fact, I know there's not a great conspiracy here. I know it's they, they are both are trying desperately to keep their leagues together. In the Premier League, they're trying to keep the big six with everyone else because big six in would claim they command the international TV audiences, which brings in a lot of money these days. And in the EFL, it's the championship clubs who claim that they're bringing in the revenue. Uh, and as a result, they get a greater vote. So with both, you have this ongoing political battle of, frankly, trying to keep it together. And that's a really hard thing. So Richard Masters and Rick Parry have a nightmare in terms of that. So I know we're critical of them, but I also look at it from what I saw when Brian Mulwinney was there. He was a brilliant leader at the yeah. EFL. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was incredibly loyal to Brian and helped him throughout. Um, but he did an amazing job, actually, cleaning it up and providing a route forward. But it was a constant nightmare to keep everyone together. And some of the th I mean, I've worked in politics as well, Chris. And trust me, right. there's nothing more political than the EFL and football. Right. Just to go back. And I do know what you know, I'm taking on board what you're saying. And, and you know, it's good because. This is a side that I haven't heard before, so I'm learning as we go along. Um, but is it a case with sort of the Premier League and the? And I want to come on to Leicester after this, but of yes, you know, it's the big six that are saying this, not the Premier League. But is the tail starting to wag the dog a little bit? You know, do they have so much power now? that you know the reason that the premier league didn't want them to go off and do the super league is because that's that's their main revenue earner and that's you know it does it still does come across that that's well, what it's all about yeah look there's always got that tension there chris and you're right on that but one thing i would say is they didn't go off and join the super league you know everyone's talking yeah. about how the governance is stopping the super league the super league was stopped well in advance of that by the way and the people I like we were, we, we were all campaigning to stop it, and we and it stopped. Okay, let's just be clear about that. Um, so, uh, and I'll come back to that again in a second. I think it's really important. I think there's some misinformation floating around again from politicians about this. Um, but th the second thing I'd say is it's 14 votes around the Premier League table, and in the uh, EFL, there's you know there's, it's got to have I think it's 75 percent. Um, through championship and, and then down through different clubs through different ratios but it's not just the big six who can do it on their own and we've seen many a thing turn down but it's often about trading and horse trading here as anything in a club there's always that situation they're all shareholders they are in effect the owners mm -hmm. of the league there's one additional shareholder which of course is the football association which is there to make sure that the game is not doing anything that would 
you know, bring it into district spirit, district yeah. spirit or, or, or have a dramatic impact, for instance, on the national team, things like that. So they're there and also to protect grassroots, etc. But the Premier League gives so much money to the rest of the game and grassroots. That's a, you know, we don't talk about that, but it's no. good. And, mm -hmm. and everything else they give is, in effect, a taxation on the game, but they have to give it, which is, well, I think, so, unlike any other league on the planet again, or any other commercial business on the planet, by the way. And again, mm. we forget about that. So that's the reality. Just on Super League again, I mean, it's an interesting point you make about the tail wagging the dog. It, we, we've talked a lot in the last week about, you know, Rishi Sunak put out tweets saying the Super League's done, you know, in top, we've done it, top bin, we've stopped it. Mm. I might be wrong with this, but my reading of the bill. So the, the football regular bill is that it's absolutely right to say you could not join a because you're going to be licensed. Every club's going to be licensed and you could not join a European Super League. You wouldn't be authorized to do so and retain your domestic license or right. have any right. link to the football association. But if you, in effect, give that up. You could go outside your UEFA FIFA model and join a breakaway league with Real Madrid and Barcelona and Juventus and others if you in effect left the whole football world as we know it today. Mm. Um, and I think we've kind of forgotten about that. And, you know, Andrew Mills, who's a former agent, he also does the SAG show. And I talk about this sort of thing quite a lot. There's a big danger there. And, you know, a lot of clubs in the past have given away things to keep the big six in. But I think they're so angry by what happened in the Super League that I think you've seen a bit more of a par back to the smaller clubs, the other 14 in effect. Mm. Um, yeah. So I don't think the teal's wagging the dog at the minute, but there's always that risk hanging over about whether they just go, in effect, well, screw it. We're going to go and we're going to do our own thing in this way. No, I think that would be tragic uh, and I hope it would fail. Um, but there is always that risk. And I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, but I'm just saying that is the risk hanging over it, I think, and it will continue for the next decade or so. Coming back on to Leicester, do you think that, the Premier League and the EFL, because I mean, they tried to sort of charge us earlier in the year and the lawyer sort of managed to get us off. I mean, it was a bit like, you know, you're saying to somebody, you failed your driving test before you got in the car. We don't have to publish, as far as I understand it, and like I say, <laughs> I could well be wrong, but we don't have to publish our accounts until, is it later this month or, or the start of next month? And yet we're being charged when we for not publishing them when we actually don't have to publish them. Yeah, but Chris, look, they're not going to be charging without knowing what the numbers are. Let's be clear mm. about that. Okay, and if, if it's as big as we think, um, that's significant. And you're saying they haven't published them, but, you know, there is a – you, you, they could. So, mm. um, you know, with – let's take Everton. Everton, in the Premier League, it's 105 million. And for, for you guys, actually, it's 105 million we're talking about over three years. Yeah. You on, on a rolling basis, okay? So you know how tight it is every year. And that and it's catching up with people. It's why the transfer window was so tight last time around. And post-COVID, it's got tighter and tighter and tighter. And we're seeing the repercussions now because that three-year cycle is through now. Um, and all the mitigating circumstances and special, um, special uh, sort of measures that you were given during COVID, you've lost now. So mm. it'll be pretty damn obvious whether Leicester City have uh, done it or not. And if you take the last two years and you look at what money was spent by Leicester and what money was incoming by Leicester, unless you won the lottery, um, it's pretty obvious. And I just don't think, I don't think, again, it's just, just be cynical about this. Ask yourself these questions. Why did big organisations with very expensive lawyers and top-notch people, whether it's EFL, people like Nick Craig's fantastic lawyer there on Premier League have similar. And they also have third party barristers advising them on this stuff as well when it gets this serious. Why would they go out and say this stuff? And like the EFL, absolutely, Nick DeMarco got them on more technical issues about who had oversight. But it will fall, it will catch up on Leicester yeah. City. But the irony is, as I get it, and again, I'm not the expert on this, but my simple reading of it is that. The argument was made that the EFL did not have the ability to charge Leicester, or, I, or not charge and put them under special measures in effect and to share a business plan and as a result could restrict their spending in the transfer window and not force them to sell players because that would have hit the promotion 
opportunities. Yes. And given the Ipswich, Leeds, Leicester, Trumbull up there, who are having the fight, you know, of course, yeah. if you're the Leicester City yeah. uh, management, uh, so, so business management and ownership, you don't want that to happen. But so you made the case that you're not in the EFL's area of control for the last three years, which is valid. Mm. Now the Premier League have come in and said, well, you must be in ours then. So you're in one of them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And this is my point. I, d I just don't believe the conspiracy theories that anyone's allowed to get Leicester City. I think Leicester City's, you know, up there with Fulham as everyone's second <laughs> club. You know, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it, but it's, it's going to catch up because the numbers will be clear in the accounts and Leicester City will know today how much they've breached it by. And if they don't, it's utter chaos because everyone yeah. should know. Yeah, Kate, Kate is one of the presenters. Uh, she's got a question for in a minute as well. But she was saying earlier that is this something maybe that the, the Premier League and the EFL haven't sort of thought about that? Oh, what do we do if this company gets uh, this, this, uh, this team gets relegated or this team gets promoted? What do we do? Is it a sort of something that they're sort of like, oh, we haven't thought about that? No, I think they definitely thought about it. And I, I would also suggest that. Everyone talks about this bad relationship between the Premier League and the EFL because of funding arguments and all, but they actually work really well behind the scenes together. You know, when I was at the EFL, we shared an office with the Premier League. You'd walk down the stairs and have a conversation. And OK, they yeah. might be in different locations, but they're in night of each other all the time. So have no doubt on the operational side, there'll be conversations happening on this. And I don't know that for sure, but I'm just telling you based on my observations and the people yeah. I know from the past, they're absolutely only interested in making sure the rules are followed and it's all done properly. So they'll definitely be cooperating and they'll definitely be talking. And the rules, I think, make it very clear that it can happen. Um, you know, there could be there could be special cases where you can uh, make the penalties um, in certain ways, but it it it. It's just not valid given the time frame and given where we are to probably be able to do it for the end of the season and alas it to happen in the EFL. I think I mean, do do you think there's more clubs out there that are going to be caught in this net? Oh yeah. I think look, my hope, and this is the old Brian Mawinney argument, is that once you start catching clubs, they stop doing it. Right. Okay? Yeah. So my hope is we're going to have a run of these for a couple of years. And, you know, I really worry about Fulham, by the way. Mm. Really worry about Fulham. We're a very, very small club revenue-wise. We don't have any extra revenue really coming in compared to others. You know, we don't have Champions League. We don't have any of that that Leicester City had for a number of years. Mm. Yeah. We, um, we, we have a Riverside stand that we've built, which has taken five, six years now. It's taken Everton less time to build a stadium, by the way, and we still haven't got it full. And it's not going to be kitted out until the, towards the end of this year. So we're missing out on revenue. And I know that may sound mad, but this all affects these numbers. You know, you need to make sure you're not having the loss. So, um, you know, we've got owners with big pockets, but I think and lots of clubs have, but it's just trying to control it. Now, look, you can make an argument, and I'm absolutely with this argument, that financial fair play, whilst it does keep clubs alive, also distorts the ability of people to do a Leicester again. Yeah. Frankly. That and and you know, that's yes. what we all love. It's the reason why everyone looks to your club and says, Wow, I remember 2016. It's because you did something remarkable. You know, it's like yeah. when Fulham made it to a League Cup final. Oh no, sorry, yeah. Europa League final. Europa yeah, League in yeah. Hamburg. I, I was there. One of the yeah. I've never been more nerve-wracked uh, ahead of a football game. It was horrible, Chris, as a Fulham fan. I'm mm. not used to being in a final of anything. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, I thought this was going to be the only time I saw them. And to be frank, it's been true. <laughs> uh, yeah, sort of yeah. But, you know, it's it, my point is, though, the whole profit and sustainability rules are there to protect clubs and keep them alive. But at the top of the leagues, clubs are not going out of business in the Premier League. Portsmouth, when they fell down, absolutely went into administration. But that was a basket case and i think you know if it was done today there'd probably be criminal cases involved in that yes yeah. Yeah. um but it's not happening at the top and i think you must allow you must there must be a third way to allow clubs to invest in some way as long as it's not putting the club at risk um and i know and, and also there's a uefa element here as well that UEFA's way of managing financial fair play is slightly different. Everyone's having to come in behind that just to fit the model and all, all of that. So, um, 
So what I'm getting at is I think more clubs will be caught out. I think it's going to come inevitable. Uh, I think that uh, we have to be careful at financial fair play actually creating a boring top six and then the rest of us fighting and like to stay in the league structure mm -hmm. because we haven't got the money. Um, but the one thing I would say is that my worry around the Everton appeal process, which happened a few weeks ago, is that the panel, the appeals panel tried to suggest that the, the way the EFL awarded point penalties was a better structure because the Premier League didn't have a structure. And that was one of the criticisms from the appeals panel. So they suggest the EFL might work across. My worry is that if you create two specific points, uh, penalties, points, deductions, then some owners will say, well, screw it. We'll take that point deduction because we're yeah. setting ourselves up for the next two or three years, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Because you're not just you know, the money's not just helping in that season; it's helping for a few seasons if you've invested it, and that's there is a concern around that as well. I think from from the one one of the things I look at is that I know in the second year that we we finished fifth and we qualified for uh, the UEFA uh, Europa League. Um, we were told at the end of that season that we were very very close. I think there was a few clubs were warned that they were close with UEFA's financial fair play. And that season, we didn't spend anything in the summer transfer window. The only Premier League team, we the only time we actually bought about phase was because Fafana went off to um, Chelsea yeah. for 60 million. So we cut our, or we tried to cut our cloth accordingly. Um and our punishment was we got relegated because you know it cost us that. And it's all you know, a lot of the fans are saying, Well, it's like we're almost being like we were being punished twice because you know, we we, we at least we tried to sort of keep within the um the restrictions because we were worn. You saw we didn't buy anybody. I think we're the only team, we only bought the one player, and I think that was the lowest of any Premier League team that season. Um, when we got relegated. Yes, we bought in some players, but we sold nearly 100 million. We sold Castagna to yourselves. We sold Barnes. We sold Great Madison. Player, by the way. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, uh, so that was nearly like 100 million odd pounds coming in. There was a lot that went off the wage bill that were on high wages, replaced by youngsters that were cheaper. And yet we're still. Yeah. <laughs> in this but, position. But, but, but I, think, I think that's the point. Your wage bill was probably, you'd lost control of it. Because of the Champions mm. League bonuses, etc., you did. I did look at the numbers a few weeks ago on SAG show when the first the rumors started, and it, it was quite surprising for me actually. You outspent spent the vast majority of clubs yes, in a couple of seasons, and I was really shocked by that because you know the story has always been buy smart, sell on, yes. and just when a few of those don't work, you're screwed. And it's like Fulham. Fulham got lucky by getting back up to the Premier League. Um, uh, and bouncing back in the way we did because we had spent in the first season was 120 something million and the players didn't really work and we didn't make broad big profit on them other than mm. Nitrovic last season um and that was only because the sides i can't I, yeah. I wouldn't have seen anyone else spending that sort of money on him so uh so we got a bit lucky really um and you got unlucky i think and you know it, it's those we, we it's couldn't those sell telemans as much as we tried yeah well yeah but but it's an incredibly fine line chris yeah. and that, that's when I, why i get fans get annoyed and angry about all this but you know you have to really it's how the club is run and you can see these things coming it's a three-year rolling cycle people yeah. will know it's like Forrest's argument oh well we didn't say sell brennan johnson to uh spurs or you know because his agents was being changed or he wasn't you know he, his valuation wasn't what we wanted it and as a result we missed out well that's nothing to do with the panel <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, yeah. you you have you have you know. Yeah. It's like saying to your bank, "I can't pay me overdraft back because of this reason or that reason." Just pay. It. You've you've known about it for yes since yeah. you've been banking with us. Pay it back. There's the yeah, rule. It's, it's, it's a good point. And before I just get onto it, and I'm conscious of the time, so just a couple of questions um, in the chat. But I just want to leave this one. This was something I mentioned yesterday, and I, I did notice that it did get a wry smile from all three of you, uh, but. You know, when clubs look at it and you look at who's been charged and it's Everton, Forest, um, Leicester and probably a couple, if they are going to be around those sort of club sizes. I think Chelsea yet, as well. 
Chelsea Sorry? will get done. Chelsea well, will get done. Will they though? This is the thing. Yes, Man City, well. 115 charges. Well, we haven't. Or just do a couple. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but Chris, Chris, this is the. And I know this is not popular, okay? But back to me being the boring guy who tries yeah. to yeah. give. Oh, no, this is what we, what we want. Yeah. It, and, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm good at being the boring guy, okay, on this stuff. So, <laughs> and I have, no, again, I have no connection, particularly no. with Man City or Chelsea, and particularly Chelsea, but I, as a yes. Fulham fan. But look, yeah. let's just take them one by one. Man City is not a buy, they have not breached profit and sustainability rules. Back to what I said earlier, profit and sustainability rules are very obvious breaches. They're only complicated when clubs play silly buggers or, in effect, try and clear mitigating circumstances and then appeal. So, in theory, as soon as the accounts are published or given to the Premier League or the EFL, you should know whether it's a breach and you should be able to take action. It should be immediate because the club self, uh, with, their, um, with their auditors, will create those and hand them in. So it's very, very obvious. The Man City is not that. No one is claiming that. What they're claiming is that they have allegedly, and just be really clear with this, because they yes. did beat off the UEFA claims. Okay, I'm not, but mm -hmm. I, you know, the Premier League are absolutely clear that they think they've got a very strong case here. But Man City did win the UEFA case, which is why we've all got to be very careful with our language on this. But mm -hmm. the claim is that they, in effect, they gamed the system financially. So it's not whether they breached it. It's mm. whether they gamed the system and, in effect, falsely credited income in different ways, okay, and through lots of different ways. So, and that's where the 115 come from. And, you know, some people say no smoke without fire, but I, I don't think we can get into it. It's incredibly complex, but it yeah. will be dealt with. And tell you what, if it is fine that they did game the system and, in fact, financial fraudulent gaming of the system – there'll be a significant punishment there because you think of those other 19 clubs, they'll want one. And that's the good yeah. thing about having that club system. They'll want yeah. to make sure that if someone's broken the rules, there's punishment. Now, come on to Chelsea. Look, I'm not an accountancy guy, um, but I understand basic mathematics. And, you know, as Lord Winnie used to say around the EFL board table, if it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, it's a blooming duck. And with yeah. Chelsea, yeah. I would suspect yeah. they're in for a big, big points deduction soon. Uh, and certainly next season, I would think. Now, let's, let's put their mitigating circumstances are, will be whether the oligarch former owner had set up contracts, et cetera, in the wrong way, and they didn't have foresight of those because of the way they bought the club, Chris. Because you remember... The government, in effect, took over the sales process of the club, which is very unusual. Yeah. Um, right. So that is the mitigating circumstance they will point towards, that they didn't know of what was there already. But it may not be good enough because they've went and spent so much. They might be so grossly over it. Now, let's see. But I would expe expect there to be significant uh, repercussions there. But again, did the ownership realize that? And was this an investment for the next five years? And they thought, we're willing to take the hit in one season, if it buys us time going forward. It's a very expensive hit, though, because they've missed out in the Champions League last year. Mm -hmm. They're missing out in the Champions League. And, and just for the record, Fulham finished above them last year, and we're trying mm -hmm. to finish above them again this year. Um, I'd and like then, to get that in. <laughs> and, and, well, I wouldn't miss that, Virginia. And if they, again, have a, if they were just imagine have a points deduction next year, they could miss out for a third. And that's costly for a team like Chelsea. Yes, so it is. Um, and I think that's... <sighs> You know, well, well, what Leicester have said here is uh, they are fighting for the right of clubs to pursue their ambitions. And I guess it is, yes, we, we we can afford, you know, if we have gone that much over, you know, the chairman's not exactly short of a bob or two, but it is that ambition. Now, how, having got to the point of where we won that lovely trophy behind me, it's then trying to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. Thank you. No, trying I, to keep I, up I, with I, the Joneses, I mean, you know. And fair play, but then, look, being the boring guy again, we're, we're all our clubs sign up to the same rules. Yes, yeah. And, the, and you, you can make that argument in the boardroom. Yeah. You can't make that argument once you've broken the rules. And that's what I'm seeing with Forrest, with Everton, with Leicester. Everyone's mm. annoyed and unhappy with the rules they signed up to after yeah. they've fallen foul of them. It's, you know, it's a bit like me being caught speeding by the police on the way home and then making an argument about the... Uh, the um the speed limit being incorrect on the road outside my house 
mm. that I've probably been campaigning for previously. Yeah. Now that's that's what it's like, and we need just to be really careful about this. That I completely accept that it's and, it, and look, I probably would have written something like that if I'd been a Leicester City um, a member of your senior management team working with your owner because he'd be angry. You're trying to keep him happy. You're got Nick DeMarco pointing towards where you could create problems for the process and all. And that's what lawyers have to do. That's why he's so good at what he does and why yes. everyone hires him. But just ask yourself, why are they doing this and what the reality is of this? And also, you know, we are always very, very good at football fans to jump in and blame everything on the Premier League or the EFL. But actually, our clubs are part of them. They, 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 they are the pantomime villains. That's the thing, isn't it, with them? I mean, and from finally, my last question here, as, 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 a, as, as a club, uh, I suppose it's better for Leicester if we delay it because it's better to go back up and then get the points deduction, then get the points deduction now and not go back up. So financially, I think that makes sense. And I think that's possibly what they're trying to do. Um, well, 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 it's a gamble, isn't it? Everything is a gamble. And that's, and that's, it's a horrible word to use, but sadly it is interlinked with a lot of football plays, particularly in the championship. The one thing I would say, the one thing I would say is you are still going to have parachute payments which puts you at an advantage mm. in in the um, in the football league. So that's my question, really. It's really a judgment call. Is it better to be in the Premier League getting up? You're having to pay your players. You, you, if you go in the Premier League, I don't think you'll compete because you won't be able to pay as much. So you'll be up to get the money and then coming down with parachute payments again. Yeah. But you'll you'll have a few seasons. I think you'll have a few fallow seasons. And as long yeah. as the fan base accepts that and are yeah. willing to, in effect, be you know get a kicking from time to time from other clubs, I see Katie's asked a question here, Chris. If it's popped up on yours mm. as well, can anyone outside the top six yes. realistically win the Premier League and remain profitable and sustainable? I think it's extremely difficult. I mean, look, uh, Katie, I would say if we didn't believe that, we'd probably not be football fans. I still believe that one day Fulham are going to come good and do a Leicester City, um, and. Uh, I know that's mad, but that's kind of why we love football, and we it have is. got to believe in it. We beat Man City, a man, sorry, Man United recently up at Old Trafford. We beat Spurs the other day. You know, football at times could do funny things, and you can have great managers who do brilliant things with players who previously have been rubbish. Just look at Fulham this year with Munez, who, if you'd asked me two months ago, I would have said was not good enough to be an EFL player, and he's now the most hot strikers goal scoring wise in the Premier League. So, you know, funny things can happen and we've yeah. got to believe. And I, you know, I showed you, Chris, my flag I take to film away from, yeah. gr from uh, grinds and also to Northern Ireland away games where it says you never expect, always believe. And I'll always believe it's possible. But then again, yeah. if you look at the percentage chances, it's probably very, that's, very that's what, that's what we thrive on as football fans, that that dream, isn't it? You know, and can I just say, I, I actually disagree with the parachute payments. I don't think any clubs should get them. So I think why? If you, for me, I think if you get relegated, you get relegated. Why should you, you know, you will get the money for finishing, you know, eight. well, we will get the money for finishing 18th, but why well, should we get more money? But, but you can't compete. So this, this is really important. And again, it's me being boring about this because I think mm -hmm. theory, theoretically, I agree with the principle, okay, where you should have yeah. absolutely equal competition in the championship. But everyone's trying to get – everyone's not in the championship to be in the championship. Everyone's in the championship to get to the Premier League. Let's be, even though the championship, I think, is an amazing league. Mm -hmm. I mean – Utterly crazy, brilliant, brilliant league. And, you know, I really enjoy watching championship football, just to say that. But everyone's trying to get into the Premier League. In the Premier League, because they are competing at a global level, the championship isn't. The Premier League is competing at a global level. So they're trying to get the best talent in and are competing against Real Madrid, Barcelona, Inter Milan, Juventus, Roma, Bundesliga clubs, uh, PSG, the whole shebang. OK, and it's the best league on the planet. They've got to pay wages and other bonuses which are way above the championship. And as a result of that and the income that's coming in, it means they're at such a disadvantage, the championship clubs against the Premier League clubs. And if they come in and they're not able to bring in talent on longer term contractual basis, 
um, than just one year. So if Leicester City come up, you'll want to sign players. You will try and negotiate into some players' deals a clause where they drop down in wages if they go back down to the championship. But the best players won't come to do that. I've tried to make that argument myself, by the way, Chris, when I was at. I tried I tried, and I had to change my views when I saw the reality of it. Players, yeah. the best players will not do it. So Leicester City wouldn't get the best players, and you'd be uncompetitive in the Premier League. So what we'll be doing is actually we'll be making the big six even safer. So yeah. when you say you're not in favour of, of, of the transfer, that's about allowing clubs to go down without going out of business and allow them to have a... The, and actually, if you look at the history of championship payments, they've not actually been as um, exaggerated in terms of helping clubs come up again from the championship. Now, the last few seasons have been a bit different, but um, the history of it, it hasn't been. So, you know, I accept why people make the argument. I used to believe it myself, but yeah. when you get in the practical reality of keeping clubs healthy and being able to compete when they're up, but also healthy when they come down, yeah. um, it, it's, a, it's, the, it's the only way, I would say, because the alternative... The alternative is what the championship and Rick Parry claim, which is we'll give us more money to the championship to bring our number up to higher. But then yeah. all you're doing is creating wage inflation and higher mm. costs of players. And you just, frankly, you're pissing the money out of the game. Yes. Yeah. And none of you, why would you have a championship sitting just under a Premier League in terms of the amount of money coming in and the standard? You don't want that because. It's not competing on a global basis, so why would you set it up to do so? No, exactly. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Uh, Brad, who is another co-presenter here with me, uh, I've noticed that Forest have appealed today their points deduction. Uh, with Everton getting their punishment reduced, is this a case of the Premier League trying to punish clubs before the uh, entire situation is revealed? He went on to ask that, uh, on the next thing. Uh, it is interesting because Forest got the smaller reduction and I do think Everton's points deduction was silly when you come to think how many points you get for going bust. And I just think yeah, it was bad. But Forrest seemed to get a lower one and, and obviously went down from six to four because they cooperated. And yet now they say, actually, no, we're going to appeal. Yeah. I think, again, it's like it's a, it's a no-risk appeal for a Forrest. Mm. It's like, why the hell not? Give it a go. If they lose another point, great. Um, yeah. But look, I, I don't like the appeals. Because I think a lot of it, I mean, everyone got lucky, I think, with theirs and a couple of technicalities. Um, we None of this has been done. So we can read the commission's report on Forest and we can see the reality. If You, you can see all that. Now mm. there's going to be an appeal process. I am pleased to see, and I think I'm right in saying this is all going to be done by uh, a date in advance of the June AGM of the Premier League where the shareholders swap. And that's really important. Ideally, it'd be done well in advance of that. I, I hate the idea of people playing the last game of the season not knowing what mm. these things mean. That's not right for any of us fans who are watching on the, on the I was going to say terraces, but they're not terraces these days, in, <laughs> in our nice seats, particularly yeah. particularly in your stadium, the very nice seats. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, so, so I'm absolutely with the concerns over that. But, you know, it, the truth will out on this. And I think... I think just like my, I'm being cynical about Leicester City, I think I'm being cynical about Forrest. And I think it's a very, very uh, dogmatic owner at Forrest who um, mm. I think uh, saying no, that they shouldn't appeal is probably not going to go down well with him. No. I'm going to, I'll end with this because I'm conscious that your kids are waiting for you to <laughs> to bed. Um, we'll, we'll have to do it again because there's so many questions that, and I'm sorry, guys, we literally have just run out of time. Uh, but Nate's just said here, all the way from America, I just wanted to say before the end of the show that this has been very informative and a great guest. Uh, hopefully, can come back again in the future, uh, just under better circumstances. Uh, thank you for that, Nate. And look, Gavin, it's been, I've learned a lot. And I think if I can come away from a show and say I've learned a lot, and I've kept my call today, so that's an added bonus. But yes, exactly. But no, I, I have learned. And it's great that, you know, that you're out there. And thank you so much for coming on and explaining it. And I know sort of you're not in there now, if you like, but you you do see it more than, and, and you understand it more than we do. And you've, you've put it in plain English, which is what I asked for. I can't ask for, for anything more. So I'm going to say thank you so much for giving up your time and coming on. And good luck to Fulham for the rest of the season. Look after Timothy for us. 
and um, <laughs> hope we'll try and get you back on and uh, maybe just have, have questions there and maybe make it uh, get get through a few more but Chris, go, go Chris, I would love that back. and you know I hope you know next season I'm sure I'll be uh be popping up there and maybe we'll have a cup of tea or something for the uh for the games and the but, but but you know it's um good luck for the rest of the season for you guys and uh what will come will come just be a bit cynical I would say about why people are doing things as long as all I hope is that when it all happens we still got a club to support at the end of the oh, day you, you will I don't yeah. think there's any doubt about that with this. And I think, frankly, it's because you've got very good owners who are backing it in the right way. And, you know, yes. that's the thing you've got to cling on to. You've won yes. the Premier League. That's done. But you've won it. You're Premier League champions, former Premier League champions. But more importantly, you have owners who are backing your club and not leaving you stranded. And that, I would say that's an amazing position to be in. Yeah, brilliant. Great. I really appreciate it, Kevin. Um, Kevin? <laughs> Kevin? <laughs> I need to go to bed myself. I can't even talk now. I need need a new set of teeth. Thank you so much for coming on and giving up your time. Really do appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, thanks so much. What a, what a great guest. And I don't know, if I can come away from the show and say I've learned something, that that is amazing. And Yes, us fans, we, we do. And, and as Gavin made the point there, we do read these things in the papers and we do see, and there are two sides. Look, if we've broken the rules, we will have to take our punishment, um, whatever that may be. And if that includes appeals, etc., so be it. But at the end of the day, what I want this to do is to galvanise us as a club and take us through to um, through to the end of the season. And I've noticed, you know, that some of the, the fan bases are starting to sort of look at top and go, oh, is it his fault? And, you know, he's the one that's got us into all this trouble. That's what we don't need. We need to get together, stick together. And um, that Band of Brothers, do you remember Band of Brothers when we won the Premier League? That's what we want back. But look, thanks very much, like I say, to Gavin. Really do appreciate him giving up his time. Thank you to everybody that's been watching. Really do appreciate it. Thank you for your questions. So sorry that we were able to get through them all. We'll try and get Gavin back on again uh, another time. And um, if you've been listening on your favourite podcast platform, thank you for lending me your ears. You can have them back now. Thanks very much. I'll see you on Thursday for the preview show. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. These videos are tremendous. You'd better like them too or I'll be back. The TalkSport Fan Network is the ultimate on-demand destination for the UK's best fan-led football podcasts. Including Leicester Till I Die, independent analysis and reaction for the Foxes faithful. The TalkSport Fan Network. Unbeatable club-dedicated content created by the fans for the fans. Follow the podcast on the TalkSport Fan Network.